Instead of trying to make the deal not die, sometimes I just try to kill it. Then I tell them all the reasons we shouldn't do it. And if they're still interested, there's a very high likelihood that this will go through. If you're just trying to avoid the no and avoid the no, you work for six months, work on your psychology, pretend that you have a company when you don't. That's Daniel, the founding engineer and board member at Frubana. They've raised $271 million. We riff on some of the best go-to-market strategies. Being deliberate about there is a known universe and I'm going to spend that ridiculous amount of time on the set up but when I reach there we already have the credibility we know what to talk to you know what the person's partner's name is you know who fans of what baseball team like whatever you need to know so you have a better meeting and then we just went after 200 and closed very poorly maybe we closed 15 but it doesn't matter that conversion rate is enough to get you to a million bucks or more a top theme with all these billion dollar founders is that they're laser focused on monetization they start the conversations with prospects early they start that in their development cycle and their customer discovery calls earlier they want to weed out the chance of building a vitamin solution versus a shark bite solution and they want to make sure that they're talking to the right person or it's called a mom test it basically teaches you how to figure out those biases like people are rooting for you and they don't want to be straight just tell them up front that you're going to charge for it and that it may be expensive but you want the problem to be solved in such a way that they're happy to pay and i would say that up front in the first meeting if you're a founder in the early stages customer discovery trying to get to the first 10 customers, you're going to love this episode. Boom. Hey, welcome to Sit Down Startup Founder Podcast. I'm your host, Adam O'Donnell, former founder and VC. I now work at Zendesk for Startups, where we offer six months free use of Zendesk for qualified high growth companies. Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, and happy to be here. Hopefully, I'll provide good content and give uh, time back to your audience. Man, we, we, yeah, we're just going to, I know you will, and your, your stories, the things you've seen have been amazing, but could you tell us more just first starting with Prubana, just your role there, and maybe we can quickly go into some of the early growth stories that, that yeah, you saw. Sure. That have. So, so I'm an identical twin. Uh, my brother's Andres Bilbao, one of the rapi guys. And then a couple of years ago, we started helping this guy who wanted to start a company called Frubana, uh, Frutas de la Cachuana, which means fruits from a, from a farm. Um, he was a, a Fabian, we call him Fancho. He's a former Rappi guy. My brother's one of the, the, the co-founders at Rappi as well. And then they had lunch once in Brazil. He showed him his thesis and said, hey, I want to build this, right? And my brother started pushing him and said, right away, let's do it. Let's do it right away, right away. He's like, oh, but I still work at Rappi. And there's this all this other stuff. And um, my brother is extremely pushy. And he asked him point blank, well, what do you need? He's like, well, I don't have a co-founder. He's like, I'll be your co-founder. Like, he's not really a co-founder. It's just for the YC application, right? The Y Combinator application. Then what do you need? Is some engineers. And he called me up and he said, we need some engineers to put this together. I was working at another company that I had started called Paladin Cyber, right? It's still going. I wasn't doing a good job at that, candidly. Uh, but I had to learn how to recruit engineers. So we got some guys uh, and we got five people together. So for the first year of Ruana, people don't know this, we helped build it and it ran while Fancho was working at Rappi. So he wasn't even there. So we hired like some Stanford MBA summer and then a, a couple of engineers and then just cobbled together something to get it going. Um, and now it's a, a quite a large business. And th just for context, what Fruvana does, it, it, connect, it connects the uh, farms with the tables, in this case is restaurants. So it creates all of that supply chain. The key insight was um, a bag of onions um, that is say, I'm making up numbers, but like a dollar out, uh, out of the farm, it was like a dollar 70 at the restaurant. And then all of that stuff was just poor logistics and bad visibility of pricing and all of that. So Fancho uh, decided to tackle that. And yeah, we've helped since very early days. And it's weird because I'm, I'm a board member. Um, and then I've tried to be as helpful as possible for many, many years. Um, so I know their story quite well. That's amazing. Well, help, help us with um, how, how big are they? Just for anyone who doesn't know, because okay, I was blown um, away. So um, what can I say? They're close to a unicorn status. So over 500 million in valuation comfortably. Um, they've done multiple rounds. They have a dream cap table that includes the likes of DST, GGV, um, Lightspeed, Monashis, um, a bunch. Like I'm sure I'm leaving people off and then they're gonna mm -hmm. be pissed, but it's, and it's a, it's a best in class player and it's an only player. There's not a comp in the US or in Africa 
or in Asia. It's the only one that exists. And it's not just a category leader, but by a hundredfold. Um, so this is going to be a big one. That's amazing. Can you tell us one of the, like any early growth insight or any growth story that they did to, to begin right before that hockey stick moment that, that you saw? So there were a bunch that the, the biggest lie that founders think is that you have a hockey stick moment in anything that's not SaaS. You know what I mean? If it's a SaaS business, then yes, you can get like one experiment that really pops here it's a hundred different ones uh, because this is a logistic company. You know what they say? They're moving atoms. They're not moving. It's not just code. Uh, they did a number of things. Um, one of the things that they would do at the very early beginning is that the first delivery would be free. So, hey, you can order some potatoes. You can order the produce or meat, whatever you want. Well, meat they didn't have there, but you can order something. It'll be free. So the closing of the restaurants was extremely high because they got to test the product right away. Uh, the cat was just the fruit uh, or in vegetables. And that thing worked extremely well. Now, Fancho, um, he was cheating. And by the reason I say he was cheating is he was a launcher in Rappi and he had launched something like 11 markets himself. You know, that Groundhog Day mentality, like when you do the thing over and over and over, by the time he was doing for one, like he really knew what he was doing. Um, so. That, that was a first test. And the other thing that he did that I was amazed by is he built a, he's a solo founder, but he built a founding team of five, five six people um, that have a sizable equity, right? So you can call them junior founders or something like that. And he would call me up and he would say, hey, there's this guy, he's a good friend of mine. I'm gonna bring him into the team. And I was like, oh. Damn it, like you don't hire friends like that. Like you need top notch. Like don't like, I, I just, it was such a red flag for me. That's how he describes them. They're super strong. Like their CFO is the best CFO for LATAM that I know, uh, Nacho. The growth guy, Tite was an uh, MBA from, from GSB and that's the least of his qualifications. You know what I mean? Like he built such a solid team. And I believe that, that is the highest leverage thing that you can do when it comes to the growth of the company. So even mm -hmm. though it doesn't feel tactical, like hiring the best people you can makes the biggest difference above all. Um, and so let me use a, a authoritative argument for this. Like my brother and I have helped build 12 companies in the last four years. We've invested in 50 and we do everything from C to Series A in Latin. So we see a lot. So when I say this is after benchmarking a bunch of folks, um, Good recruiting never fails. Even if they're bad at a bunch of stuff, they'll recruit someone who's good at it. That is good. And we've, we've heard this a lot, uh, but it's something that you just can't forget because like at the end of the day, it's about people. If you don't have good people, it doesn't work. And those people are going to figure it out. That's amazing. Well, I mean, let's move right to your current company, Truora, and right. the incredible growth that you've had. How, how big are right. you right now or in yeah. terms of ARR? So let me correct you. It's not my current company. It's my, my company. This is my baby, the one that I'll be remembered for. Um, yeah, I love it. What we do is we uh, connect uh, companies and um, their users through um, any channel. Uh, we're WhatsApp first. We started as a background checks company, very similar to Checker. Then we built KYC. So basically you can buy... Um, you can get a credit card online and we do all the face validation, the voice match, everything that's required. And then we realized that in order to really help emerging markets, the true platform is WhatsApp. So we decided to become WhatsApp first. So the way you think about it now is if you want to buy stock, you can say, hey, on WhatsApp, have an interaction and buy uh, Amazon shares without ever needing to download an app. So we do all that customer engagement, like the onboarding and customer engagement. Uh, we're a little bit over four years old now. We're close to $8 million in ARR. Uh, we are in six, seven countries. Um, and we started like bootstrap uh, for the first year of the company or almost a year, we, we raised no money. Uh, and then we've done quite well. Um, and everyone now is scared and dying and we're growing quite nicely and we burn less than 150K a month and we got 14 million in the bank. So we're sitting pretty in this market. <laughs> Congratulations. This is unique. Notice, and I, notice how I didn't speak about valuation. We we have a valuation at 75 million. I just, I'm a fundamentals guy. I, when you ask me how big is our company, I'll tell you what our revenue is. That's what matters. Valuation is BS, in my opinion. Um, so, so we're pretty, pretty decent company. 
I love the fact that you prioritize the fundamentals and, and obviously you're an investor as well because the, the best investors care about that. Help us with the 8 million ARR. I mean, in four years, that's incredible no matter what. Uh, what well, was in LATAM, the- in LATAM, it is very difficult because a dollar in LATAM is like three or four in the US. So yeah, I, 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 I bet you won't find a ton of companies that can do that in SaaS. There are some, but it's really hard. Yeah, a million ARR in San Francisco is still celebrated. <laughs> so, eight million uh, in Latin America is incredible. Help us with some of the early, maybe one of the most impactful early growth stories. Um, uh, so we so we did B two B long sell cycles. So at the beginning, I did most of the sales, if not all. So maybe the first hundred and fifty k of MR. So the first two million was mostly me and Maite, uh, my co founder, um, just going at it. Um, I think that when you're doing B2B SaaS, you just have to go and sell. Uh, Whenever you see a founder that says, oh, I need to hire a VP of sales. No, you don't. You need to learn how to sell your products because no one will do a better job than you. So that was the first early growth. Uh, And then with one of our products, it's called SapSign. So think about it like a DocuSign that is optimized for WhatsApp. Um, Renato, who, who leads that, did he literally built a digital signature product that started with the assumption that people are going to open this on WhatsApp. And it's grown like in an incredible manner. They have 12,000 users. Um, it's the most recognized brand in Brazil uh, and it's growing like crazy. So the, the focus there was take a platform that is going to be better than what exists. And in Latin America, email for small businesses is somewhat useful. WhatsApp is the tool that people use. And then he decided to build everything around there. Um, so if you're doing emerging markets, you should definitely use SAP sign with a Z. Um, and it works quite well. That's amazing. Let's get under the hood a little bit more because I'm thinking of all the founders out there who maybe have 10,000 MRR. They're trying to get to that next level. You were selling. Tell us what that actually meant in terms of your day-to-day. So you were selling. Um, say, think if you know Checker, you'll understand what like the type of business that it is. So there's gig economies, there's fintechs, and they all need to do a background check of some sort. So I would just get a list of the 200 companies that are the largest. And then I would try to get the name of the founder, then the email of the founder, then the phone of the founder, and then a um, intro, right? And then we would have a KPI, which is out of this 200, what coverage do we have of each thing? And once you had the best thing, which is a warm inter, a warm intro from someone who likes you and is respected by them, then you're golden, right? Because you're so much closer. Um, and then we would we would share what we were trying to build um, and try to be and try to be good with people. Um, so being deliberate about there is a known universe, and I'm going to spend that ridiculous amount of time on the setup. So when I reach there, we already have the credibility. We know what to talk to you know what the person's partner's name is, you know, who's like their fans of what baseball team, like whatever you need to know. So you have a better meeting. And then we just went after 200 and closed very poorly. Maybe we closed 15, but it doesn't matter. We have, we barely had a product, right? But that conversion rate is enough to get you to a million bucks or more. Um, So that's, that's what I would suggest. Got it. This is cool. So what I'm hearing right now are things that you also didn't do. You didn't just go blast the list. Well, that's not- silly. They're like, that's silly. There's YC says do things that don't scale. And, and I'm not knocking on email marketing. Like you can absolutely do blasts of emails and try to pester people and all that. But when you're doing large B2B sales, like enterprise sales, 200 companies to make up a number is not that many. Like, you, if you can blast 2 million people, by all means, go nuts. But if it's more tailored and it's a product that's risky and you need and you, you have a pretend company because we're so small, then what you're selling is trusting you as a founder. So they need to speak to you. And if you send them some random email, hey, do you have this problem? They're going to go like, yeah, probably, but who are you? Whereas if an investor of them says, hey, that problem that you have, these guys know how to solve them. They're reputable. Then it's so much easier. So we went, so we went that far. I love that when I was a founder, I did two different types of outreach that, and I had different successes and failures with each of them. But one of the things that I'm hearing here is when we were in the early days of the product, pre-product market fit, or just like discovering if we had it or not, if we, if we talked to someone who came through a warm intro, they, we found that they always were much more biased to give us false positive feedback on the product versus someone who didn't know us and was simply judging us based on where we were 
with the pain we're solving and the product we're solving. How, yeah, did, I would agree you, with that. Absolutely. That, so, how did you so work around that? There's charge. When you make sure that someone pays for it, they're not doing you a favor and they're not, and they're not doing, yeah, there's, there's a good book that we read recently that taught me all of this after the fact, it's just horrible. You should have read it before. It's called the mom test. Um, it basically teaches you how to, how to figure out those, those biases. Like people are rooting for you and they don't want to be straight. Um, but no, the, you just tell them up front that you're going to charge for it and it, that it may be expensive, but you want them, you want the problem to, to be solved in such a way that they're happy to pay. And I would say that up front in the first meeting, um, mm. we would use some other strategies, like say, look, we, we have a strong engineering team. We're going to build this, but only for five customers, we already have three. Do you want to be the fourth? That's uh, that sort of thing. Like there, there's ta tactics that you can use where you basically what you're trying to do is to get their buying and to test it a lot. And something that I will that will suggest for, for business development deals, where it's a big deal and you're trying to make it happen, instead of trying to make the deal not die, sometimes I just try to kill it, which means there's someone on the other side and then I tell them all the reasons we shouldn't do it. And if they're still interested, then there's a very high likelihood that, they, that this will go through. Whereas if you're just trying to avoid the no and avoid the no, you can like, work for six months, work on your psychology, pretend that you have a company when you don't, right? Or you have a client when you don't. So, so trying to kill the deal, it requires a ton of grit and a ton of, oof, like you're, you're, you're facing the, the, like you're facing the worst case scenario right there, um, but, it, but it can be very effective. I, I like to do that a lot, actually. I love that. That, that was one of the biggest mistakes we did is we, uh, you know, freemium, you, you see arguments on either side product. So, but we, we were giving it away for free in the beginning and we had people actually installing it on their website. And we we're like, if they're doing that, then that it, it was like an email. Um, it was, it was a marketing automation tool to try to capture more people that went to your website. And what, so we had all these people excited and we felt like we had something, we were doing everything we could to not get the no. So making that huge mistake, we, we, we were like, okay, we know we don't have their money, but we have their time and that's where something, and we know we're clearly delivering value, but we did have a business. And we didn't realize that until we started to try to push on the price. And once we did, they immediately were like, Hey, yank it off the website. We're done. And we we're like, what? I thought so, but we wasted six months. <laughs> so exactly. I, I love like, try to kill it. Don't avoid the no. no, Get you charge, no. charge for it. Charge for it. If the pain is big enough, people will pay. If it's not, then you're, are you selling life? Like what is it? Uh, critical medicine or are you selling vitamins? Right. And the difference is whether you charge or not. I love that. It's not rocket science. It's amazing. Thank you for that clarity. So in terms of fundraising, I know you've had incredible sure. success on that as well. Sure. For someone who's maybe a pre-seed level company, they're they're making a little bit of traction. They they know the basic things you're hearing from YC and Saster's content and all that, but maybe some insights that you've heard that's like one of the most impactful, unique things that you that you did that made a difference. Okay. Well, I made so many mistakes in my first company that I decided to become a connoisseur of fundraising. I became friends with VCs. I became friends with LPs. I said like this stuff, I was going to use a bad word. It's never going to happen to me again. Um, so we, my brother and I think about this a lot. Um, and then there's vanilla advice, but I'll give you the, the best thing I can come up with is you do not learn fundraising by talking to funds. That's the stupidest thing you can do. It's like trying to learn poker at a poker tournament with professionals. So dumb. Like, and I'll go even further. If you are a Stanford or HBS or that type of person that has always been successful, it's even worse because your intuition and your ability to solve problems is what's gotten you there. And then it's what's going to make you look like a fool during fundraising, right? So what you do, like the key rule is, you don't learn fundraising by fundraising. Like you do the homework before. You prepare, you talk to founders. That's why I'm such a fan of angel rooms. It's because you, by the 20th time you're meeting with someone, you're so much sharper than the first one. And we do this with our incubations, like with the builds we call them. If I introduce a build to a VC, three months off, they will immediately say no. 
right? And then we've done that mistake in the past. And then they raise a 4 million at 20 or something like that. And the VC is like, yeah, I don't know why I didn't, why I missed that. Like he didn't, it was, they were just green, right? So the learning is do not learn fundraising by talking to funds, never. Only when you're prepared, you go out. And if you need to get the reps, you get them from founders, you get them from angels, you might get them from one VC friend that you trust, but never in the market. Never, ever, ever. I have yet to see that go well. Because even when it goes well, like, like say you, Adam, you're lucky, you do a round, it's super easy. When you're going to do your A, you're going to suffer like you have no idea. Because all the things you thought from before were not learned. You know what I mean? You, you just you base yourself on your own experience. So that's it. Don't ever learn fundraising while you're doing it. That's just stupid. I love that. That you, you've you hit on something because I there's so many founders that we talk to and we try to help them with fundraising. We we try to create environments that are safer. Like we have a VC pitch deck teardown that we do frequently here at Zendesk. We get a panel of VCs and we get founders to submit their deck and then the VCs kind of review it live. But we have hundreds of people watch those as a way to just like learn how a VC thinks when they see a deck or when they're evaluating a company. Um, but you can't when you when you show it to them, it's like any information that they're getting about that startup, they have to keep in their head if they're evaluating you because they have a fiduciary responsibility to their LPs. So anything they know, they can't unknow that. It's like- I'll give you, I'll give you a good test. So we're talking to founders right now. Like, do I know fundraising? I'll give you a test. Think about this yourself. What is the probability that if a fund is crazy, crazy interested in you and they're going to have their uh, investment committee on Monday, what is the likelihood that they'll invest in? Think about that in your head. If you're sure of the number and it's really bad, you probably know a little bit about fundraising. <laughs> if you believe that it is 30% or more, you don't know fundraising. About one in 10, that's the math. So when I see, I, I hear founders, they'll call me and they're like, hey, Daniel, I need you to help me negotiate a term sheet. I'm like, okay, send it. It's like, no, 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 we haven't received terms. I'm like, what do you mean? No, no, they just said they love it. They just need to go through committee, but that thing is Monday. So on Tuesday, I'll get the term sheet. I'm like, oh my God. That is, they may have a one in 10 shot of getting terms. Probably if they're doing really killing it, one in five. And then they're shocked when the thing doesn't happen, right? And then it deflates you. It's a whole thing. So unless you have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten committees happening at once, the likelihood of being on the other side with a term sheet it's just not there, right? And in this market, it's even worse. So yeah, you know what? I have a second piece of advice. Assume right. you do not know how to fundraise. Even when you think you do, assume you don't. And if you have that mentality, the likelihood of, of hitting blind spots will be lower. I love that. I mean, that's humility at the, at the end of the day. I really appreciate that. Help us just with a tactic. So assuming all this is true, what's one of the biggest things that you learned during that period? where you were doing it wrong? That when I was doing it wrong? Man. Okay, uh, the first one is incentives. You're playing a game. If you don't understand who's playing and what their incentives are, then you're going to miss stuff, right? Uh, you don't know their fund size. You don't know where it stayed in their cycle they're at. You don't know how they think about valuation. You don't know what they look for. You don't know what their biases are. Like right now, if you, like I'm talking to a founder, Right. And I say, hey, who are you talking to? And they'll say Andreessen. And I go, who are Andreessen? I'm like, I'm not sure. Let me let me remember the name. That just shows you that they don't understand who the other side is. Right. So just not knowing the dynamics, not understanding the game, not understanding the incentives and not getting it on a human level. Like if you don't understand what a career in VC looks like, what they're trying to do. It's tough. Like right before we spoke, Adam, did you notice what I was doing? I was asking you about you, about your incentives, what you're trying to do, what a good outcome is so that I can cater whatever I need to do to your benefit. Because I always know what I need. I'm trying to figure out what you need. The same thing for a VC. But when people go after money, they're just looking at a, like at a cash register or they're looking at an ATM as opposed to looking at a person with incentives and a bunch of things behind. And you really need to get that. And once you do, you become really good at it because it's just about aligning incentives. 
That's so good. When I was a VC at a small fund called Mighty Capital, reviewed about 2,000 companies at the pre, at like the Series A level, and my biggest thing was was just like the the uh, the likelihood that you get an investment. I looked at we were we invested in like 0.7 percent of companies that were in our database, meaning they've reached out to us in some way or we heard about them through a referral. So just that is crazy. But also understanding like how hard it is to be a, a VC fund. Like they have all the money, right? But they don't really have any money themselves to operate unless they're like a a massive fun. So right. just that, and just like the pressure on them to actually perform with that money, because LPs are considering all sorts of investment vehicles. The venture is just one of those investment vehicles. They're considering the stock market, just like anyone would already. So this is like a long-term game. And if they can't deliver incredible returns, like it's actually the, the, the market's better because you can't get your money out of venture investment for you know five to seven years at least. So I, I think it's just having empathy for them in the same way. Like if you don't, if you can't return their fund, just your company, then you shouldn't be talking to them. Right. It's people forget VCs are founders. They're Mm. just founders of a different company. Their Mm. product is you to their LP, their resources is money. Right. So when you think about it as talking to another founder, it really like the conversation is just different. I, when I talk to VCs, I literally tell them what's your assets under management. What is your, like, what is a, what is a good year for you? Blah, 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 blah. And when you have that discussion, then you see if you're aligned or not. Um, so yeah, talking to the other side and understanding them makes makes all the difference in the world. And Daniel, this has been amazing. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and Google. If you want to learn more about Zendesk for Startups and our free offer, please check out our website at zendesk.com startups.